interface right now we're going to talk about horizontally launched projectiles. These are objects that are launched horizontally. So they're not launched up or down at an angle, they're not launched straight up, they're just going to be rolling off of a surface, thrown directly to the side, but they're going to just be starting off with an initial horizontal movement. Whenever we approach these problems, I always recommend starting off by creating a list of the variables you know. Horizontal variables and vertical variables. So for problem one, given the following situation of a marble in motion on a rail with negligible friction. Part A is to sketch a motion map. Part C, uh, B is to do the force diagrams. C is to calculate how long the ball is in the air for. And then part D is to figure out how far the ball goes. But we should start off with those variables. Now, every single time we have a horizontally launched projectile, we know that we are starting off with a, an acceleration of zero meters per second each second. That's going to be true while it's in the air, air, and because this is going to be a ball moving on a frictionless tabletop, it's safe to assume it's zero acceleration on that surface as well. Other things that we can assume um, for the vertical motion is if it's horizontally launched, the starting velocity is zero meters per second and the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second each second. And I'm going to say that down is not the negative direction, so that will be negative 9.8 for me. These are the only variables we know to be true every single time we have a horizontally launched projectile. But for this problem, we do know a few other things. One, we know the height. It starts off at an initial position or an initial height of 1.5 meters. And presumably, it ends up on the ground, which has a height of zero meters. We don't know what the final velocity is going to be, nor do we know how long it's in the air for. For the horizontal variables, we know that we can probably say that this right here would be the starting position when it rolls off the tabletop, which we can say would be a position of zero meters. We don't know where it ends up, so that's going to be a question mark. But we do know that the starting velocity is 10 meters per second. And because there's zero acceleration, the final velocity is 10 meters per second. We also don't know how much time it's going to be in the air for. These are the variables that we know. This allows us to set up a fairly qualitative motion map, showing the motion of the marble after it leaves the tabletop for part A, just keeping in track what's happening here. Now I'm going to start off by sketching a rough trajectory of what the ball is going to do. So when it starts off here at the tabletop, it's going to just move down in this parabolic arc. For a motion mark, uh, map, every single time I put a new dot, that represents the position at some subsequent interval of time. Because we haven't done any calculations yet, this is going to be fully qualitative. So I'm just going to be adding my marks at what I assume will be the positions in even intervals of time. The way that I'm setting that up is because I know horizontally it's moving at a constant velocity. I know that for every interval of time, horizontally, it goes the same amount of distance. So that's why I'm showing every three boxes to the right, I have a new dot. I can support this by showing my velocity vectors. So this is my velocity vector for that initial position. This is my velocity vector for one second later. But because I'm saying it's the same velocity, I label it the same as the initial one. And I can do that for each of these. I draw them the same size, pointing in the same direction to show that the velocity is constant. Now, my vertical velocity, however, I know it starts off with zero vertical velocity. But it speeds up as time goes on. So I'm going to be drawing my arrows longer and longer and longer for each each time I have a new position. And I'm labeling that with a new interval for my velocity to show they're not the same size. But this would be a rough way to show what our motion map is going to look like. For part B, where we are sketching a force diagram for the marble both when it is on and off the rail, showing the horizontal and vertical motion of the ball in each case, describing that. So I'm going to have this part of the space for my on the rail and this point for my off. One thing that I can say when the ball is on the rail is I have a force of gravity pulling it straight down. The force gravity on the ball or the marble by the earth. But because it's also on the rail, I have an upward force normal on the ball or the marble by the rail. 
I'm going to say those are the same size. There's no change in motion up or down as far as I can tell, so those forces are balanced. While it is moving to the right, I don't have anything that is pushing it to the right, and because we have negligible force of friction, I don't have anything pushing it to the left. So in this case, I just have my up and down forces. So my sum of my force horizontally is zero newtons. Because the forces are balanced, that is one way that I know that my horizontal acceleration is zero meters per square second. I can say the same thing for my sum of the force equation vertically. It's zero newtons. That is the force normal and the force gravity opposing each other. But because overall we have zero newtons of force, um, overall acting on them vertically, that's how I know that my vertical acceleration is also zero. Now if I were to draw a force diagram when it was off the rail, while it was in the air, in that case I would still have that same force gravity pointing down on the ball by the earth, same size as it was previously. But it's no longer in contact with the rail, so I no longer have that upward force normal. So this ends up changing my sum of the forces equations. It does not change my horizontal one, there are no forces left to right, so I still have that acceleration of zero. But vertically, my sum of my force equation on the y-axis is equal to my force gravity down. That's how I know that my vertical acceleration while it's in the air is negative 9.8 meters per square second. That's where I know every single time I can um, put those accelerations for my horizontally launched projectiles in that list above. For part C, once the ball leaves the table, calculate how long it will take for the ball to hit the floor. What that's going to really be is how long it takes for the ball to move downwards. That's vertical motion, so I'm going to be focusing on my vertical variables. I know all of my vertical variables except for my final velocity, the instant before it hits the ground, and the time it is in the air for. I'm looking for the time, so that means that I would need to choose one of those two equations with time. However, I cannot use that second one because I don't know what the final velocity is. So that means that I'm stuck using that very top equation unless I want to solve for what the final velocity is. So I write down that top equation. My final position is equal to my starting position plus my starting velocity times time plus one half my acceleration times time squared. And just to show this vertical, I'm going to change one thing about my position annotations. Instead of x's, I'm going to say that because it's vertical, it should be y's. It doesn't change what the equation is telling us, doesn't change how we use it. It's just a way to differentiate between vertical and horizontal motion. So my final position, it ends up on the ground, 0 meters. It started off in the air at 1.5 meters. It started off with a vertical velocity of 0 meters per second, times time, what we're looking for, plus 1 half my negative 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration times time squared. I'm trying to solve for my time, so I'm going to simplify and rearrange this equation as much as possible. My starting velocity times time would be zero times the time. That would have no effect on this problem. I would move that starting position over to the other side so I can show that my change in position would be negative 1.5 meters. And that would be equal to the effect of the acceleration. One half times negative 9.8 is negative 4.9 meters per second squared times time squared. So that way, when I try to get time squared by itself, it's negative 1.5 meters divided by negative 4.9 meters per second squared. Because I'm trying to get time by itself, I would have to take the square root of time squared as well as whatever negative 1.5 divided by negative 4.9 is going to be. So when I plug it into a calculator, I end up with 0 0.55 seconds for my time that the ball is in the air for. So that's going to be the amount of time I have vertically, 0 0.55. However, if that's how far the ball, how much time the ball is in the air for, I also know that that would be my horizontal time because those two things would be the same amount of time. That's how we know how much time is moving horizontally, which is what we need to do for part D. In the time you calculate in part C, how far will the ball travel horizontally before hitting the floor? So we're looking for a position. That would either be the first or the third equation. Uh, the third equation is not going to work because our acceleration is zero, so it wouldn't really tell us any of that. 
That means we have to use the first equation once again. We're focusing on horizontal motion, so I'm leaving my position as x. x, my final position, equals my starting position, plus my starting velocity times time, plus one-half the acceleration times time squared. We're looking for that final position, so I leave it as a variable. It starts off at what I define as zero meters for my initial position, plus my initial velocity of 10 meters per second, times the times it's in the air for, 0.55 seconds, plus one-half times the acceleration horizontally, which is zero meters per square second, times the time it's in the air for, 0.55 seconds squared. Um, because that first term is zero meters, um, and the last term is a product, including zero as one of those products, um, that first and last term don't really affect it. So really, our position, our final position, would just be a result of that 10 meters per second times the 0.55 seconds of travel, or 5.5 meters that this ball is in the air for. So this would be the horizontal position it ends up with. We ended up getting that horizontal position by first solving for the time that the ball was in the air for. When we tried to solve for problems using our horizontally launched projectiles, once again, I strongly recommend starting off with that list of variables that you know. Every single time, we know that the acceleration horizontally is zero, and the acceleration vertically is 9.8. We know that because of the force diagrams that we would have, particularly for the force diagram when the object is in the air. We can also make the assumption that the starting velocity vertically for a vertical motion in a horizontally launched projectile should be zero. Every other variable just comes from analyzing the situation. Once you have that list of variables, then that's where you can use those kinematic equations to try to select one that includes the variables you know and the variable that you're solving for. So ultimately you can figure out for variables such as the time the ball is in the air for and the distance traveled while the ball was in the air.